Well, thank you very much. It's a great pleasure to be here. It's a, clearly a very important topic. Um, and I think, first thing you mentioned, we are UK trade investment, so we are a UK wide organisation and, and we represent all of the UK. Uh, in fact, I just, uh, somewhat bizarrely, found we had in with investment success from Channel Islands, which I learned was actually not part of the UK. So if you don't represent the Channel Islands, they are the man, but we, we are a UK wide body and we still get our patients in all of those. Uh, in all of those nations being vitally um, I think why, why do we exist? And this was sort of stimulated really by the Strategy for Life Sciences, which was published in uh, December 2011 uh, by the Prime Minister, which is really to sort of say, how can we use our sort of excellent research base really to translate uh, that excellent research from our you know, universities and, and so on into the clinic and into patient benefits? And I think what's not on this slide is that um, on the same day Innovation, Health and Wealth was published, which really was the, sort of the, the document that said this is how we're going to translate this into the National Health Service. And so two, two key documents and two government departments published on the same day is what sort of stimulated me to join the government after a long time in the industry about 18 months ago. And I think the, the science budget is roughly 4.6 billion, which has been uh, ring-fenced, I believe, uh, funded through biz. And you know, the end total NHS budget across the uh, across the UK, I believe, is the order of uh, 820 or 8 billion uh, billion dollars, of course. So, 4.6 and over 100 billion is a very big research budget that we believe we can bring inward investment into the UK to generate more research for the benefit of NHS patients. And so, we were sort of set up as the the organisation focused on life sciences, which is principally around healthcare, to bring investment into the UK. Uh, we're part of UK Trade and Investment, and UK Trade and Investment is half within Biz, uh, Business Innovation and Skills, and half within the Foreign Office. So what that gives us is around the world, I believe it's in the order of 107 embassies and consulates where we'll have somebody who has a life science background or speciality who can work with foreign investors to come in here, invest in the UK, uh, in our view, for the benefit of, of NHS patients. How do we see that working? Um, we see ourselves as, as a patient-centric organisation, and we see the patients at the centre of this, because ultimately patients within the NHS, and I believe there's 62 million or so, are our voters, they're the people who pay the taxes, and they're the people who we serve. But how are we going to deliver the best healthcare to those patients? It, no one single organisation can do it on their own. And our view, this is a sort of Venn diagram, as we've drawn here, overlapping between the National Health Service, uh, industry clearly providing sort of investment and innovation, uh, academia uh, funded principally through biz, and of course, very importantly, the research charities, uh, many of whom provide vital uh, research dollars, but also major uh, patient engagement, which is absolutely vital to making this project work. And I think one of the key things that sort of links it all together is e-health and data. We've got a lot of investment here in the UK. How can we actually bring those very disparate and complex organisations together? Because they all fundamentally are patient-centric organisations. So I think what are we here to do really is to sort of build the, the UK ecosystem to connect, you know, research, uh, develop, validate, and then export. So our idea is if we can bring foreign investors in here to invest in UK research, that can develop new technologies that benefit NHS patients first, we hope, and then those can be exported abroad, bringing further income. So we strongly believe there is a connection between wealth and health. So I think we have a supportive business environment here in the UK uh, for, for sort of healthcare, and a number of sort of new, new policies have sort of pushed us in that direction. Uh, again, we have an open and flexible regulatory framework, and clearly the more open and flexible that can be without jeopardising patient safety, of course it's absolutely vital to bring you know, more research here to the UK. I think we and others have worked to have simplified industry access points. Where does industry come? Who do they talk to? How can they talk to the right principal investigator or physician to get that research done? And really through our embassies and consulates worldwide, we have a global connectivity. And you know, in the US, for example, we have a, a, in Japan, uh, and across the European Union, we have a network of, of embassies and consulates. And we realize that many people invest in the UK because they want to export to Europe. Uh, you know, the UK alone is only a few percent of the global market, whereas the European Union is a very large, a very large uh, market, and one that, although it's complex in some ways, and that is very important to people invest in the UK. So, what has the government done to uh, make it a more competitive environment for, for industry? I mean, one of the key bits of legislation which we're getting a lot of interest, um, particularly, for example, from US companies right now, is around the patent box. Patent box is a piece of legislation that means that if you qualify, your uh, qualifying profits for patent box go down to 10%, which we believe is the lowest corporation tax in the G20. 
Um, for, for many years, it was seen that the UK was not a competitive tax environment, but for those companies to qualify, this means that they can come here, house their patents here, and develop those patents in the UK, hopefully treating the benefit of NHS patients. And particularly, certain you know, companies, for example, in California, now the corporation tax rate is 43%. Uh, here, if you qualify, those profits are about 10%. So you know, this is a very significant um, pull for inward investment into the UK. For those companies that are not profitable, we have R&D tax credits. Of course, these are available across Europe, but you get up to 27p back in every pound spent. And so for non-profitable small businesses, your employment taxes, your national insurance and PRA, can actually be plowed back into the research and business in the following financial year. Uh, a number of them, just talking about the, the UK Research Partnership Investment Funds, and obviously the Biomedical Catalyst Fund, these are funds that are to invest with grants into, uh, in, into new businesses, often for targeting in terms of biomedical catalysts, small to medium-sized enterprises that are driving a lot of the early stage innovation. So, so we believe that you know, a lot of this is moving in the right direction, but clearly what we want to do is to see those products move into sort of clinical trials as fast as they reasonably can. Clearly, uh, private investment is also important, and this is just a sort of snapshot of capital raised by leading European countries. Clearly, uh, the US is, is, is much more capital as raised in proportion, but you can see the, the UK does punch above its weight and is comparable clearly with Germany and Switzerland. And in life sciences, much more needs to be done. But our view, there is there is a sort of um, a possibility of raising private capital to develop those sort of smaller businesses that can then work with the larger businesses that can translate new and innovative products into the clinic. Again, just the point, as I said earlier, we are a, a UK-wide organisation, and we work obviously with England, Scotland, Northern Ireland, and Wales. And, and I think you know the industry. Uh, uh, gentleman from, from Charlotte sort of pointed this out, is that you know, people want to know, well, how do I, maybe that I want to access patients in Scotland, how can I do that? Uh, we can hopefully help navigate that process. I think uh, the lady from the sort of charitable sector as well was saying, I think a lot of the charities are UK-wide, and so we work often with the charities who are leading and breaking down those barriers, because you know, patients, particularly in, in conditions like rare diseases, you may not have enough mm -hmm. patients in, say, Scotland or Northern Ireland, but across the UK you have, and, and you know, how can those networks be uh, much more interactive? Because they've all been trained in the NHS, they've had a similar training, and, and although NHS is a sort of a confederation to some extent, that they will have that similar belief and a similar training. So we want to sort of tap into that for the benefit of the whole of the UK. I think we see huge opportunity in, in unlocking data to drive innovation, to use data to actually find where those patients are, where is the medical need, what medications have they been on, how can we actually scale those clinical trials for foreign investors? Because coming from the pharmaceutical industry and the small biotech industry, you often have to run too many clinical centers worldwide because you don't know which ones are going to deliver, where the patients are going to where they're going to be. So I think we have a pretty uh, unique um, opportunity in the UK. Clearly, uh, we're not as big as the US. As you can see, the US has a much larger population, but it's much more sort of disparate in terms of you know, being able to access those different data sets. Clearly, sort of Scandinavian countries, for example, have you know, very good patient records, a long history of doing this, but they're relatively small, and so you can't scale. Whereas across the UK, we have 62 million patients. We believe, particularly if you're looking for rare and stratified conditions, this gives us a big enough population size where we can find those patients, engage those patients, and, and hopefully find you know, that they can be put on trials which will lead to medical benefit. Again, I think there's some, some talks later on the UK Biobank, uh, so I won't talk about that now, but clearly it's uh, you know, absolutely vital to have access to tissues and things to really take the basic science to the patient, I would argue. Uh, the Clinical Practices Research Data Link, or CPRD, uh, again, uh, allows many sort of pharmaceutical companies, biotech companies, to find out where those patients are, what their records are, in an anonymized way, of course, to say, why come to the UK and do your trial rather than go elsewhere? And of course, uh, again, there's the NIHR bioresource, which enables the recall to clinical studies by genotype and phenotype patients within the uh, NHS architecture. And so basically, we believe by having over 60 million patients uh, to able, this is actually a huge selling point for the UK and will lead to significant benefits to those patients. I think stratified medicine is very important. It's something we can do well in the UK. is to get the right medication into the right person at the right time and to start to do that, obviously, with existing medications, but more importantly, um, do that with new medications. If we can actually target those medications to the right patient group early on, 
that actually solves many of the pharmaceutical industry's problems. I mean, having been in the industry for the best part of 20 years, if, if not more, um, the, the problem is that most R&D in the pharmaceutical sector doesn't work. And so where things don't work, you know, those losses have to pay for the successful products. If you can make smarter clinical decisions earlier, and you find out that your drug is going to work and who it works in, in you know, phase 2A earlier rather than later, that's a massive savings to the pharmaceutical industry and potentially is a paradigm shift in, in how they organise their business. And so I think you know, this is something the UK is very well set up to do. Um, and you know, just the, the market value of targeted cancer therapeutics is, is over $40 billion and growing. And, and, and of course, there are many other indications where a stratified approach, in our view, will lead to greater efficiencies. The UK has had a long history in using genetics and, and building genetics, as you can see here. Uh, obviously, going back to 2009 for the UK Biobank, and you can see some of the milestones that have, that have happened over the years. But this has been a long-term strategic project, in some ways going back to 1952, and Crick and Watson and others in turning out understanding you know, the structure of DNA. So we believe this is a, a long-term strategy and something we now really need to deliver to the benefit of patients rather than you know, just sort of building and just academic papers, you know, very important and enabling as they are. So I think the other thing we, we, we see is very important is uh, consumer research tools, platform technologies and informatics solutions. And, and again, it was announced you know, uh, that the UK plans to take hold, hold genome you know, sequencing up 100,000 NHS patients over the next three to five years. Again, on a voluntary basis, of course, which will enable us really to understand many of the genetic basis of disease. Uh, again, there's many sort of uh, partnerships between industry and, and, and you know, government and obviously charities, you know, the Cancer Research UK Stratified Medicines Programme, for example. And, and we can see that the, the National Health Service is becoming with 60 plus million patients as a real test spread for products and services. So that the NHS patients are uh, on you know, the most innovative therapies, or if, if they choose to be so, early rather than late. So we're bringing innovation to the UK and into the NHS as best we can for the benefit of NHS patients. So I think what we hope is that why would people come here, and it's this sort of fundamental point, because the UK can help businesses demonstrate clinical and commercial proof of concept. It's generating that commercial argument, as well as the medical benefit, to say if you do it this way, it's actually going to be better for patients and it's going to save money. Because in any healthcare system around the world, you know, budgets are clearly not infinite. So I think um, you know we have a rich and diverse ecosystem here. Uh, as I said before, it's first-class research and expertise in the UK. You know, many of the key opinion leaders that are on the boards of foreign companies are come from the UK. We want to actually build that that R&D capability in the UK and capture that value for the UK. I said you know world-leading data and translation infrastructure. You know, based around our NHS. And, and established value and supply chain is how does this complex supply chain work? It's much more complex than it is in any of my, my other industry colleagues in, in the NHS, in say automotive or financial services. We have a very, very complex supply chain. If we can get it right in the UK, that's good for NHS patients, it's good for industry, and I think it's good for the nation. I think what's very important, and, and, and uh, Earl Howe touched on this, is creating an open and flexible regulatory framework. I worked in industry and, and, and you know, 20 years ago, it was that question, we did all our clinical trials, our first demand studies in the UK. For a whole variety of reasons, things have become more complex around the world, but the UK's predominance has, has sort of waned. And I think we, we're starting to really see you know, turning the tide now, people are coming back to the UK. And so there's been a government commitment to opening up the NHS to collaborate with business on research and adoption. Ensuring that products and services are critically appraised at a high standard. I mean, the UK stamp of approval is, although many, many industry findings are frustrating, is actually people use it. It is a, it is a mark of quality. And I think, as, as Earl Howe said, transparent expert advice, streamlining as best as possible the hurt health research approvals process. And, and again, you know, we are a globally regulated, you know, our regulators are globally recognised, and we do have the EMA here in London, which is, is a huge uh, help, I think, to bringing inward investment into the UK. Clearly, early access is, is important for NHS patients and for industry, and, you know, we're potentially discussing other things like adaptive licensing. How can we be more creative in getting new innovative products into patients? So I think I've sort of sent these slides, and I don't wish to steal anyone's thunder here, but I was so excited by these slides I wanted to show them, because this is the sort of thing 
that we need, because obviously when we're going around the world promoting what is good in the UK, we can all talk generalities and the big statements, but it's actually hard data. Most of us are scientists, we get driven and excited by data. But I think it's these sort of things that are showing that you know, everything is moving in the right direction. And so here we're looking at year-on-year -year improvements, i.e. reductions in times to review all applications. And you can see that um, the curves from, I believe, it's sort of 2010-11 down to 2013-14 are moving down. They're moving in terms of times are moving down. So it, the mountain is getting smaller and moving to the left, which is, which is positive. And, and hopefully we'll see a, continue to see a year-on-year -year improvement in that. And it's this sort of data we like to use and promote around the world. So people say, you know what? Things are actually getting better in the UK. That's really important. I can see the trajectory of travel. Again, um, steady increase in the uptake of a proportionate review since its introduction. I won't go into the details here because you'll hear more about that later. But you can see that um, you know, proportionate review is increasing relative to full review. And I think you know, that the mean time to complete full review is stable, uh, as it is for proportionate review, you know, 35 days for full review and 12 days. So you know, what does industry like? Industry likes stability. It likes to know what's going to happen as best you can. Certain world. So if you can show that in the UK it's respected, it's stable, you know what you're going to get, it does what it says on the can, that is very helpful, I think, in terms of bringing in investment into the UK to great jobs and wealth, which we believe has a major impact on health outcomes. Again, there's also a downward trend in the, in the use of provisional opinions and an increase in the favourable with additional conditions. I won't go into the detail of this, but these are sort of some trending data. Um, that is clearly uh, going in the right direction, we hope. Um, and I think the point here is less than 6% of all applications receive an unfavourable final opinion. So this means that this is more efficient, I guess, in everybody's time, because it means that if you have um, fewer unfavourable opinions, that means we're focusing on things that are more likely to be successful, and that means it's efficient for business and efficient for, we hope, for the UK to deliver better healthcare outcomes for its population and its patients. So I think why is it so important to us in UKTI is this creating this open and flexible regulatory frame. But this is this is a big pull. It's one of the biggest pulls uh, in, in terms of getting inward investment here in the UK. So clearly opening up the NHS to collaborate, turning the NHS into as I think it always was probably since 1948 a research-driven organisation uh, that actually brings research to the UK and, and develops and moves forward the most innovative products. Ensuring that those products and services are critically embraced to the highest standard because quality and the reputation in the UK and protection of patients should be paramount. Just because it's faster doesn't mean the quality should be reduced. And I think we can we are seeing some very significant improvements in time to review. And I just show you a snapshot of the data, and I'm sure you'll 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 hear a lot more about that. So I think it's you know fantastic. Well done to our colleagues here today for, for making those improvements. So thank you very much, um, and again, very happy to take questions. Um, clearly, we're here to hear your views, and uh, you know, try and help bring inward investment to the UK to really benefit not only business but the NHS. As we see the two things as being synergistic. But thank you for your time.